physiology first and then we go ahead with XX DSD and XY DSD separately and then we have Dr. Subrutu who has got a wonderful collection of cases who will go through all the physiology will come back live. So my role is only to talk about physiology and how it is relevant to make it easier for everybody else so that we don't have a repetition and it becomes easy in that perspective. So when we talk about sexual development, we all know that we start from a single cell and everybody is same and then finally we have a gender dimorphism which happens. This involves an interplay of genetics, gonads, hormones, receptors and differentiation. So problems can happen at any level, genetic level, hormone formation, gonad formation, hormone formation, hormone action and finally differentiation. So this is what is DSD. So we'll start off first of all with gonad development. So first step in the overall development is the development of the gonad from the urogenital ridge. So urogenital ridge is the common area of three organs. They are the gonads, adrenals and kidneys. So these three are formed together and this happens by around four to six weeks. So very early in gestation. Then we have some players which lead to development of what is known as a bipotential gonad. So the initial gonad can become both testes as well as ovaries. And in this situation, the few genes which play an important role is NRF5A1 at 6 to 7 weeks, which basically plays a role in gonadal development as well as adrenal development. So if you have a problem in this gene, you will have adrenal insufficiency as well as abnormalities in the gonadal development. Now, very often we may see that it may present only as DSD without adrenal insufficiency, but we need to be careful that we need to assess for adrenal. The second important player in the development of bipotential gonad is WT1, and this also plays an important role in the development of kidneys. So, if you have a gonad problem, look at kidneys and adrenals. From there, these two converge. And along with SRY, which is the master gene overall which decides about the gonadal fate, they work together in tandem, particularly NR5A1 because it works at multiple steps from there also. And these two then combine and activate what is known as SOX9, which is a major determinant of follicular cell growth and production of the sertoli cells. Not follicular, sertoli cells pretty much the follicular cells. So this produces AMH. While we have anti-testis genes like FOXL2 and DAX1, which basically result to development of ovaries. So we have a bipotential gonad. If there is SRY and SOX9, it becomes a testis. If there is no SRY, no SOX9, it will depend up ovary, it will develop into ovaries. There is a fight between the testicular and the ovarian genes, particularly SOX9 and FOXL2. And if you have too much of the ovarian genes or anti testis gene, you will have a bipotential gonad in a male which will develop into an ovary. So these things can happen. Few key genes to remember is WT1. Why? Because WT1 will be associated with? And Danish Dash and Fraser syndrome. So any child with XY DSD, you will have to be very, very careful about renal abnormalities to happen. Why? We need to also remember our NR5A1, which basically again will result to adrenal abnormalities. So now let's go. We now have the development of the gonad and the gonad is developed into testis or ovary. We next get into the germ cells. And the germ cells come from the silomic epithelium at 6 weeks. They migrate and they migrate basically these are the various, these are not very important because these conditions are not very important. They get localized at the level of ovaries and then 10 to 11 weeks after that they are in a resting state. They don't really do much, they just stay like that and then they start towards term to start producing the follicles which will produce estradiol and all those things come later on. So ovary is a quiescent organ during the fetal period. While testis, you will have germ cells which are there, which will also stay there but testis will be working a lot. So you need an active fetal testis to produce a boy. You don't need an active ovary to produce a girl. So the message basically is that XY DSD is largely an act of omission. In which 
your work is not happening. You don't have a gonad, you don't have a testis, you don't have testosterone, you don't have dihydrotestosterone, you don't have androgen receptor. You will have XY DSD. But if you don't have a gonad, you don't have a ovary, you don't have estrogen, you don't have aromatase, you don't have a estrogen receptor, you will still be a girl. So XXDSD is an act of commission. So this is a very basic difference, act of commission and omission which will help you distinguish. Now these germ cells are actually destroyed in the blood, but if some of them persist, they go into different parts of the body and cause germ cell tumor later on. Not much important. So now in testis development, there are various genes which play a different role. So NR5A1 affects which cell line? So there are two or three major cell lines, Leydig cell, Sertoli cell and germ cells. So NR5A1 control. SOX9 predominantly controls the Sertoli cell. And Sertoli cell produces? AMH. AMH. And this AMH and inhibin B, this will basically cause suppression of the Mullerian structure. Simple as that. Leydig cells are largely controlled by the NR5A1 and there are two things which are produced by the Leydig cells. One is, which is very simple. Second is, insulin-like factor 3. And this insulin-like factor 3 will cause, it will act on the testis and cause descent to happen. So testicular descent has got two parts and Dr. Rajat will definitely talk about that is the descent from the abdomen to the inguinal region and from the inguinal region to the actual scrotal position. The descent in the abdominal phase is regulated by INSL3. The inguinoscrotal descent is regulated by testosterone. So if you have no gonad or gonad is not working at all, it will be, where will the testis be? Abdomen. If you have a selective problem in testosterone production or action, it will be in the inguinal region. region. So location of gonad in an XY person will tell you what problem you are dealing with. So if you have real gonadal dysgenesis, it cannot be, it cannot even go to the inguinal region. While 5-alpha reductase and AIS will be in the inguinal region. So now germ cells, we don't talk much. So ovarian development, this is less important because we said that even if you have zero ovaries, you will have external female appearance which will happen. But WNT4 is particularly important here also. We have the theca cell which produces? Theca cell produces? Androcinidinone. And we have the granulosa cell which produces? Estrogen. And what converts androgen to estrogen? Aromatase. aromatase. So if there is no aromatase, you will have low estrogen and you will have high androgen. So this will result in what picture? XX DSD. But very important catch. What will happen to the mother? Mother will virilize. Because fetal adrenal is a factory for producing DHEA which goes to the mother where aromatase in the placenta produces estriol and that's why your estriol levels are very high. So if you have an aromatase deficiency in the placenta, you will basically have maternal virilization. So simple question, every child should be asked with atypical genitalia, did the mother virilize? Yes, it is either an exogenous drug or it is aromatase deficiency. So this will be very important when we discuss subsequently. And then we have the oocyte which produce the MH and this we are not really concerned. A few words about steroidogenesis. We talked about basically about ovarian development, testicular development, but how do they make these steroids? So there is a common pathway which basically involves three enzymes, side chain cleavage, star and 3 beta HST. After this three, what will be formed? Product here will be progesterone. And progesterone is the most important product of the metabolic pathway because if you do not have progesterone, you will have no survival, they will die because they will be having abortion at that point of time. So a progesterone has to be formed. From here in adrenals, we have 21 which produces cortisol, 11 produces aldosterone and 17 produces DHEAS. This same thing is also there in the testis where you further have a 17 beta HSD which produces testosterone and then aromatase produces estradiol. So basically, you need to understand that if you have a defect here, you will basically have no hormone production. Along with that, you will also have salt wasting. So salt wasting and no hormones. So that is presentation as X 
by DSP. This will be an act of omission. So if you have these proximal defects, they will typically present as DSP in males along with salt risk. There is one exception. Free beta HSD can cause virilization in girls. Why? Why? It produces DHEA, which is converted peripherally into androgens. So this peripheral conversion is good enough to cause virilization in girls, but it does not cause any change in boys. So this is one condition which we have to be very careful about. So now we talk about testosterone action. So testosterone acts via the 5-alpha reductase to produce dihydrotestosterone, which acts on the androgen receptor to cause defect on the external genitalia. <coughs> testosterone also binds to the androgen receptor but the affinity is much less. So you need much higher concentration of testosterone to produce the effect as compared to dihydrotestosterone. So now you can understand very easily how 5-alpha reductase deficiency will affect the genital development. So in 5-alpha reductase deficiency, DHT is not formed. Now which part of the genital system will have a high testosterone exposure? Internal genitalia or external genitalia? internal genitalia because there it is locally produced. So these will not be affected in 5-alpha reductase deficiency. But external genitalia where the testosterone has to go to the blood and then reach there will be affected. So you will mainly present with what would be like a penostotal hypospadia is the usual presentation. As you become pubertal, your testosterone levels will go up and you will have virilization, penis at 9, and I'm always tempted to call this as a Shikhandi syndrome because this is the classical description of 5-alpha reductase deficiency. Born as a female who then converted the gender and developed into a male at around 10 years once they came from a penis. So this is very classically described in our own literature earlier. What about estrogen? So estrogen action happens to ER alpha and ER beta and they act on breast development, bone maturation and uterine growth. Even if you have zero estrogen, so what is the estradiol level at birth? Is it detectable or undetectable? There may be transplacental passage which may be there and you may have a single follicle at birth. But ovaries do not produce any estrogen by 36 weeks of gestation. So everything will develop even if you have zero estrogen overall. So now coming on to just the development of internal structures. So in males, of course, this is the combined development where we have Mullerian duct and Wolfian duct. In males at 7 weeks, we have AMH. It will suppress the Mullerian duct and the Wolfian duct will then develop using <coughs> testosterone into epididymis, vast difference in seminal vesicles. So this is how the male development happens. If you do not have AMH or if the AMH is not working, you will have Persistent Mullerian duct syndrome. So in that case, testes will be where? Up or down? Why? Because it cannot come down. Because it is blocked by the Mullerian structures. Female development, basically the passive process, but you need testosterone to sustain the Wolfian structure. Otherwise, estrogen will cause further progression of Mullerian ducts into fallopian tube, uterus and upper part of vagina. The lower part of vagina is separate. So even if you have an androgen insensitivity syndrome, you may have a blind vagina, which you can actually be able to locate. So just having a vagina doesn't mean that it is actually not a DSD. You can have a blind vagina because of the lower part of the fold in this situation. Finally, about the external genitalia development, it occurs mainly because of DHT in boys, as I said, and there is a window of 8 to 13 weeks. If you have testosterone deficiency before 13 weeks, your phallic size will be low, you will have penostotal hypospadia. If you have testosterone deficiency after that, you will have only micropenis. Now, can you think of a condition in which the levels are normal in 12 weeks and then they become low? Okay, anything else? <laughs> that is one, Kalman syndrome, very classic. So in Kalman syndrome, in the first 12 weeks, testosterone are high. Why? Why? There is no LHFSH. Why should they be high? Because? So what? 
So what HCG acts on the testosterone to produce the testosterone. But after 12 weeks, HCG is gone. So you present with micropenis and not DSD. So hypogonadotropic hypogonadism should not be suspected ever if somebody has a hypospadia or a abnormality. In females, estradiol production will basically result in external development which is there and there is no fusion if the exposure is after 12 weeks. So labiostrotal fusion suggests that there was an antenatal exposure in this perspective. So I think what we have tried to do in this situation is this is not very important because this is relevant in terms of gender identity but this is largely regulated by androgens. And this is now known that if you have a fetal androgen excess you may have a problem in gender identity later on. We will not discuss much on this. So I think from this perspective we have clearly summarized uh, that the problems in DSD could happen because of either omission which will result in XY DSD. So you can have no gonad, gonad which is defective, no testosterone, 5 alpha reductase deficiency or AIS. While in the XX DSD usually you need to have extra androgen coming in which may come from the adrenals or which may come from the aromatase deficiency. So these are the two broad groups. And then of course we have the complicated ones, the over testicular DSD, which will be covered subsequently. So I think we try to cover the overall pathophysiology to set the pace. And now the next batsman can take up and accelerate the score from here. Please visit our website learning.growsociety.in, the go-to place for pediatric endocrinology learning. Happy learning.